And this is another edition of 3D Printing News Unpeeled. And today we've gone, well, it's already, uh, it's only May, the end of May, and we've got some of the most exciting news of the year already. So, uh, and that is that Desktop Metal has just announced that it and Stratasys are said to merge. Uh, the two companies are uh, said to have a transaction that will close in Q4 2023, and they're trying to launch the next generation additive manufacturing company that will offer everything from industrial polymer to metal to ceramics and uh, the whole shebang. The idea is that together they will accelerate adoption and uh, desktop metal will continue to exist under its own brands, such as X1, uh, uh, Hydro, Aerosynth, and Forest, and things like that. But the combined uh, 1.1 billion revenue company uh, will have a, a su supposed EBITDA margin around 10 to 12% in 2025, uh, which seems that it, it's going to be a bit of a tough uh, time going ahead. Uh, the margins there don't seem to be uh, super great. Uh, uh, the, the totally, it's an all stock transaction valued at 1.8 billion. Uh, and they hope to get about 50 million in uh, run rate cost synergies around 220 uh, and 225 as well. Uh, the transaction essentially is that 0 0.123 uh, ordinary shares of Stratasys for each share of desktop metal class A common stock, which values desktop metal 188 a share, which is up a little bit from a couple of days ago. Uh, there were some rumors yesterday already. Uh, but still, it's it's uh, a little bit below what it is, but it does not represent a huge premium as the stock stands at this very moment. Uh, so f existing Stratasys shareholders uh, stand to, to control about 59% of the combined entity, and the, uh, desktop metal shareholders would own about 41%. Um, so their logic for this is explained by the companies thus, is a complementary product offerings, uh, including aerospace, automotive, and consumer products. Um and, uh, you know, the better, uh, you know, strengthening the balance sheets, go to market infrastructure. And uh, the idea is that uh, they hope to then combine forces and deliver joint innovation together. Um, the Yav Zaif will lead the company. Uh, Philip will become, Rick Philip will become uh, chairman of the board. And, you know, I think, okay, so first glance, I said yesterday, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine. I said, no, nah, this is not going to happen. So I was really skeptical about this. I think Strauss is a good long-term winner in the 3D printing industry. It has made very few mistakes. It has done very uh, many dumb things. And it is long-term set on growth and growing as polymer business. Um, and it should really profit from this in the long run by commercializing applications and commercializing machines. Now, having said that, it wasn't able to do anything really magical. It wasn't able to come up with some magical uh, product that would, like, light a fire under sales or light a fire under, um, uh, you know, the, 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 their, their channel sales and really, really grow the company in a really, really accelerated fashion. Stratus has so far has not been able to, with SAF, with the origin printers, with all the technologies it bought, it has not been able to really kind of like, you know, get a ton of excitement around its offering, first off, or get a commensurate amount of sales to really be on the path to becoming like a super growth kind of company. So it's a stead growth stock that is slated to continue doing this. And now it's catapulted itself into the number one position in the largest company. So, okay, what's there to like it? Well, okay, on, 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 so I think that this is a more financially risky path for Stratasys is taking on a company that has not, does not have a lot in debt and has, or does not have a lot in cash. Uh, the combined entity of about 437 million in cash, which is okay, and be a very noticeable entity in the 3D printing world, the biggest company in the 3D printing world by far at the time, probably. Um, so, so this is like, you know, this is the consolidation that we were all kind of expecting, but we didn't think would really, really, really make sense, right? Because you know, it's the, it's the do you do the kind of tortoise or the hare, and are you the tortoise that is slowly climbing towards its goal? that could be overtaken by events, or are you going to be the hare that jumps around very lively in a very much more risky thing? And Stratasys has now opted to be the hare. So, you know, on the one hand, there's a logic here. Cross-sell to existing channel, eliminate a competitor. It's a very complementary portfolio. Stratasys is software a little bit, some service, um, and it's got uh, a polymer. It's a polymer shop. Meanwhile, desktop metal has ceramics. It's got sand casting. It's got metal casting. It's got binder jet. <clears throat> it's got these uh, uh, all sorts of technologies, right? So 
there's a lot of complementary stuff. So a lot of existing desktop metal products could be sold by Stratasys channel and sales, right? Now we know that this isn't as easy as it would think. You know, if you've just sold material extrusion machines for 20 years of your life, and getting your head around a binder jet system and the kind of valuations and the kind of things and the technical sales stuff you need for that is actually quite difficult. Um, so, you know, so, so this is not as easy as it sounds, but it, the logic is there, right? We become the biggest player. We cross sell to our existing customers. We cross sell to our existing channel and we double up. We now all of a sudden we do ceramics, we do metal, we do all sorts of technologies together. So the, the logic there, I understand how you could kind of try to defend this and stuff like this with these complementary technologies and complementary offerings and this global reach, right? Now, having said that, on the uh, the negative side is like the, you know, Dessel Metal has had some, some issues with quality, issues with rolling out products, issues with keeping its channel happy, issues with keeping its customers happy. You know, how much revenue is the, the combined entity going to extract from these products if we're looking at 2024, 2025 and beyond? We all know that the hype and the promise of binder jet is there, but you know, to what extent can the combined entity for half of its total in, in, in the shares extract enough value to make that a useful decision in the next couple of years? Right? So if we're just looking at the revenue, how much revenue does this combined 1.1 billion revenue group think that they can actually really extract from, from desktop metals, binder jet, and other tools in the current state? I think that that's actually going to be really difficult. And I think it's going to be really difficult to grow the X1 business because it's a really clunky sales item. There's a lot of difficult to sell machines, a very technical thing. It takes customers many, many years to get comfortable with the technology and deploy it at scale. It's done really well recently, but only because they've been working on this for a very, very long time. You know, meanwhile, BinderJet is a really interesting technology, but I don't think it's a technology you can throw a lot of geometries at. I don't think it's a technology you can just use in kind of the way that people are using powder bed fusion, throw a lot of things at a service environment. No, to me, it's a technology where you have a defined library of parts that is dialed in, and then it may work for those parts in a very cost-effective way. Now, so there are cases where BinderJet really makes sense and really makes sense <clears throat> for particular parts and, and making these parts low value. But it isn't a replacement technology for the aerospace stuff, the implant stuff, and it isn't a, a replacement technology of kind of a metal powder bed fusion type of technology or an easy accessible powder bed fusion technology because the qualification is difficult. Parts in green state are difficult. Parts tend to fall apart and, and, and it's difficult to qualify and get these shrinkages right going forward. So, you know, to me, you know, looking at this from a, you know, a helicopter view on the one hand, I mean, everyone expected consolidation. This is one of the things that, that is, this is one of the most talked about things that's going on. Who's going to buy desktop metal and how is it going to fit together, right? Is it going to be somebody outside the industry or is it going to be somebody inside of our industry? And there's not that many people that are big enough to merge with them or buy them. So this is something that we've talked about and kind of expect. Still, to me, it's a surprise. Um, to me, I'm not entirely sure if that product portfolio is enough to warrant half of that company to give half for, share, for, for the half of that company to go to other people in order for them to extract enough revenue and enough profit out of that in the near term to make that transaction worthwhile. That's the thing, the big question. I just don't think that Binder Joe is mature enough as it stands. And I don't think that, it, that onboarding customers is going to be as quick as people think. It is going to take many, many months. The sales cycles are going to be very long. And it's going to take many months for that to convert in, in, in reliable, returnable revenues. And so to me, that's the biggest problem. Now, is there an interesting port product portfolio between Envision Tech and, and, and Desktop Metal and all these things and the patents and all the technologies it has, Aerosynth, stuff like that? Sure. There's a lot there to like. Uh, there's a lot there that you could commercialize in a way. There's a lot there on the polymer front. You know, Don't forget, Stratasys now has its own materials manufacturing unit as well on the polymer front for these resins. So there's a lot it can do there between the origin technology, between Envision Tech technology. There's a lot the company could do to dominate in hearing aids and extract a lot of value from hearing aids. There's a lot it can do for jewelry and there's a lot it can do for uh, uh, you know, dental aligners, kind of those kind of types of businesses where it can extract a lot of profit from this and the combined entity making the materials and making the, uh, the machines together. That could be a real profit center for them. Again, BinderJet, I think, will ultimately could be really worthwhile, but I think it's going to take a lot longer than these guys think, especially if you're given the maturity of the product portfolio as it is, and the maturity of customers. A lot of people may have been working on Powder Bay Fusion for a long time, but no one or very few people have been working on, on BinderJet for such a long time. And we've got complementary offerings from other companies as well. More and more, HPG, Mark Forge have complementary offerings. So it's not going to be that they can waltz over this, so one, two, three. Now, having... 
uh, there's a combined service offering now as well. They could do service with Binderjet and service with all these things. They could become a big player in services as well. That's a play they could do. They could be hefty. They could move into Shapeways or other kind of service companies, do a kind of roll up there and become a very big service player. That could be very well be a, 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 an interesting path forward. And yeah, it's going to be a supermarket for 3D printers. It's going to have absolutely almost everything you need except for like high-end uh, powder bit fusion. It's going to have almost everything you need in one stop shop. So that's going to be very valuable. But there's risks there as well. That means also that your R&D budget gets split between a lot of different technologies. It gets split between, uh, on the one hand, you've got uh, the, the binder jet, you've got uh, DLP type processes, you've got origin, uh, different platforms from the same DLP thing. Are you going to get rid of one or the other? Are you going to keep a closed system? Are you going to keep one open system? How many models are you going to bring out? Yeah, how is that portfolio even going to make sense for an outside person? Uh, they've got SAF slash Aerosynth, SAS, all these kind of powder bed fusion technologies and metal. Uh, and then you've got the sand based technologies and several different platforms as well. Um, you know, so it's going to be really complicated. Yes, there's going to be a lot of R&D to do, but you're going to have to spread that budget out over very, very distinct technologies that are very different drivers. You have light-based technologies, work with photopolymers. You've got laser-based technologies. You've got inkjet-based technologies. Now, there's a lot of inkjet going on. Maybe they can increase their, their, their use of inkjet and their understanding of inkjet, maybe get a better deal for Rico or something like this. But I really don't expect a lot of, like, um, really, like, you know, huge consolidation from there, you know, unless they really rationalize the product portfolio and really bring it back to very, very few offerings or maybe an open offering and a closed one or something like that. Um, could they cut more fat from Stratasys and Desolate Metal? Could they let people go? I think they could do that. Does it make sense to do that? In a lot of cases, it doesn't really because you don't want to get rid of R&D people because there aren't that many R&D people out there that can actually know what they're doing for 3D printing. You know, so... I don't know. On the whole, I, I just think, I just keep coming to this point. We're going to have a big company that has to spread its resources very thinly and that is going to need to extract a significant amount of revenue from a less mature technology than it's been extracting revenue from now. And I think they're going to have a hiccup, some issues with that. Now, I think in the long run, being the biggest trumps a lot of other things and being the biggest can really, really make a difference and really makes you a survivor and makes you out, out battle, outlast uh, other players in your market. So in the long run, it's going to be, it may be a very smart play, but for now, in the next couple of years, it's going to be very, very tough going for the, the general Astrasis ecosystem, the general Astrasis, uh, you know, staff and partners. And it's going to be very difficult for them to in integrate this offering in a meaningful, useful way and to, to do this in a, a cost efficient way. We're trying to extract half of the value of the company, if you will, from, from technologies that are less mature than the ones they have, that are more complicated than the ones they have, that are difficult, more difficult to sell, that take longer to sell, and uh, that are more difficult to implement. So, you know, it's going to be, it's interesting. This is the biggest news of the day. It's the biggest news of the week, month, maybe a year. Um, uh, you know, do you think this is going to close? Do you think that there are going to be problems? Do you think this is a great move or not? Tell me in the comments. I, I, I don't know at this point. I think it's going to be tricky. Very, very tricky for the both firms in the, in the medium to the, in the short to medium run. In the long run, this may very well work out because it just, it's just a consolidation that makes them the biggest on the block and could give them a lot of heft. Anyway, this is 3D Printing News Unpeeled with your spiels, courtesy of 3dprint.com. I hope you enjoy this, found this useful, and uh, yeah, have at it. Let me know in the comments what you think because uh, um, uh, my mind is uh, kind of buzzing at the moment. Anyway, thank you.